Hey, y'all, this is Chase Griffin, quarterback at UCLA and two-time NIL National Athlete of the Year. And this is One on One with ADC Partners. Hi, this is Dave Almy of ADC Partners, and thanks for checking out this latest episode of One-on-One Sports Business Conversations. I hope you enjoy listening. Now, Chip Kelly, the head coach of the UCLA Bruins football team, once remarked that he wouldn't be surprised if this episode's guest, Chase Griffin, wound up as president of the United States one day. And after getting to spend some time with Chase, frankly, I think Coach Kelly's expectations might be a little bit on the low side. Chase is currently a quarterback at UCLA, and that on its own would be a pretty remarkable accomplishment, but it really just scratches the surface. You see, Chase is also among the most successful college athletes in terms of name, image, likeness, the new ability of college athletes to make money marketing products and services. And with over 30 brand and charitable partnerships, Chase is a very successful, so successful in fact, that he's twice been named NIL Male Athlete of the Year. In our conversation, we talk in depth about both his football and NIL experiences and what he believes contributes to his remarkable accomplishments in each. We also discuss the advice he shares with other athletes seeking to emulate his success, what he believes the role of universities should be in supporting athletes in NIL, his feelings on sharing media revenue directly with athletes, and much, much more. Oh, and in a bit of breaking news, we even talk about possible running mate choices, should he ever decide to make that run for president. Enjoy. Okay, Chase Griffin, let's let's begin by touching a little bit on your football journey, right? Because that's where it brought you to this point. So I'm, I'm kind of interested in what some of your first memories what are some of your first football memories have and and when did you become aware that this was something that you know i'm actually kind of good at this football thing so my first memories of football weren't really as a player but uh as someone who loved watching football oh you loved just watching on tv early on absolutely my first sport was soccer so i grew up idolizing you know Ronaldinho I had the Ronaldinho cleats uh, my favorite team was Barca at the time he was there they had a young Messi but Eto was really the scorer on that team how old were you at this point like how like would you, you would just you're like little so I so I started playing soccer at four and uh <laughs> I didn't start playing tackle football until I was about 10. I don't think I've walked at four years old <laughs> in in that in that range from seven eight nine I would play the soccer games on Saturday, and on Sunday, we would watch NFL football. And my favorite player was LaDainian Tomlinson. Oh, I, I used to watch the Chargers. You know, they had Chambers, Vincent Jackson, Phillip Rivers, but it was really LaDainian Tomlinson. Who was a force of nature when he was at his Ab- prime. Absolutely. So I yeah. always wanted to play tackle, but my parents were like, no, no tackle football until you're 10, until, until fifth grade. Fifth grade. So did you play soccer concurrently the whole time? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, up until around 10 or 11. And then that first season of tackle football, uh, I'd been training with Jeff Blake. He taught me how to throw, taught me how to play quarterback. Not a bad and, guy to have as a teacher. Absolutely. And that first year, I think we went eight and one. You know, we're one of the best <laughs> Pop Warner teams in the city. And I was like, man, I really like football and I really <laughs> like playing quarterback. And you were playing quarterback right from the start. Yes. Okay. And so early on, I mean, you go eight and one in Pop Warner your first year. You think, okay, I've kind of got this thing going on. I'm pretty good at this. And it turns out apparently a lot of other people thought you were pretty good at it too. Right. Because I read this article that called you a 13 year old prodigy. I mean, right. I, I've never been called a prodigy at anything in my entire life. Maybe, maybe brushing my teeth at one point. <laughs> but you so you get this you get this 13 year old prodigy thing and you start training with some pretty serious people one thing that i've always been blessed with uh is is a family of support and yeah. a family that also supports the ability of finding experts uh if, if there give you the resources that, that you need 
Absolutely. Whether yeah. it was, you know, violin at a very young age or soccer, I always had the best trainers. And I think by seeking out that expertise and trusting it, uh, that's how I, you know, had a growth mindset when it comes to building out skills. Was that something your parents came to you and said, this is, you know, what you want to do is a little bit beyond our skill set, or is it along the lines of something that said, Hey, I kind of want somebody to work with on this, or did it work a little bit both ways? I think both ways. I, yeah. I think, uh, both my parents are excellent in what they do. Mm-hmm. Uh, my father's great in marketing, great in production. My mother is best teacher on earth, best mother on earth. And uh, <laughs> and they were both excellent at what they do. Yeah. Um, so they recognize and, how to do it. Absolutely. And I yeah. think they recognize that uh, and they empowered me that when I had a dream or I had a goal or I had a vision for myself, yes, we're going to support it, but we're going to actually support it with action. And if yep. we can't get you the best resources, we can't get you the best training, then we'll find who can to help you build that dream. Absolutely. And I think yeah, similar yeah. To, to the Suzuki method uh, of playing violin, where the parents learn with you, you know, my father was at all my training sessions. So when when we'd go to the training on, on one day a week, I would, I would have my quarterback trainer, my quarterback coach teach me how to do it. And then we go in the backyard the other six days and, and we do the same drill. Right. Working and reinforcing. Were those expectations, like when you get called a 13-year-old prodigy, were were you aware of that at that time? Were you aware of people's like, wow, this this kid's this kid's going places? And then if you were, how do you manage that as a 13-year-old? I definitely was aware of it, but I also think in the same way I always had support from my family, mm-hmm. I always had high expectations from them. And yeah. all of those sort of became internalized where the highest expectations for me always were self-set. You know, it, it wasn't my father's goal for me to, you know, grow up and play football in college and, and God willing, win a Super Bowl. These yeah, were yeah. my goals at eight yeah. years old. Yeah. And so the expectations have always been sky high. And a lot of that goes to, you know, my foundation, which is my faith. Yeah. Uh, you know, that that's really empowered me to have a, a perspective. And I think at times, sometimes, you know, I wouldn't say imposter syndrome, but you definitely feel like you're you're in a situation where you're like, man, the expectations are really high. But I I never really question myself because I know that I always give it my all and I always try to find the joy in it. Well, it doesn't the faith give you a place to go when the road gets a little bumpy, when you do have those moments when you're like and it, and it keeps you grounded. It keeps you grounded when things are going super smooth or the, everything's going well because you realize regardless if it's going well or not uh, our perspective of what's good and our perspective of what really matters sometimes can be warped by what media says by how you know a game goes you know certain plays can go one of two ways and a lot of time it's not even up to you but that can affect your whole mood that can affect your whole career when at the end of the day uh, you got to take everything with a grain of salt and realize what really matters. Yeah. So coming back to that place of centeredness of that foundation of just being able to have a baseline of reliance on yourself, whether that's through faith, whether that's through family or whether that's just on perspective, you've been able to build over time and all the repetitions and everything you've done. It really gives you a baseline from which to start from. Right. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. I think everything else grows for that. I hit this sense. So, so you, 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 you go to UCLA, right? You become a quarterback there. And I, I have this feeling that there are a lot of people, particularly of my generation, uh, for people who cannot see this conversation, I am a little older than Chase is. Um, for people of my generation, they have this kind of antiquated idea of what it means to be a college athlete. They have this kind of thing like, oh, well, you know, you show up, you go to school, and then you play sports, and then you come home, and that's pretty much it. It's not like that. D1 football in particular, there are some incredible pulls on your time. And so what I'm hopeful to do, can you give a quick highlight of what a typical week looks like? Because I think this comes, this will be relevant when we start talking about NIL, because it adds a whole nother layer right. of, of things you right. do in responsibility. So what's a typical D1 football athlete week look like? So during season this year, we practice on Sundays as well. So you are seven days a week. Basically. So, so say, say it's an away game and we played a five or seven o'clock game, probably get back to the facility around two or 3 AM. 
get back home, shower, uh, hopefully get to sleep around mm. three thirty, and then wake up around noon or whatever for check in. Uh, then at two thirty, we have team meeting. Then we go into position meetings and then practice at four. So I'm going to stop because practice begins at four, but you're doing a series of meetings leading up to practice just to get all Absolutely. the game plans in place and, and review what happened. Game game plan, flush the previous yep. game, all of that. And then so Sunday is our relatively light practice. <laughs> your seventh day on is your light practice. It's good to know. <laughs> right, right. And then uh, so Monday's a full day. So Monday, get to the facility before 7, uh, meetings from about 7.30 to 8.45, practice from around 9 to you know, 10 30 and then lift after that. Then we go to our class block is from 12 to five. So that's where you go to all your Monday classes. If you got one or two scheduled uh, and then at five fifteen, more meetings. And then after that, around six, we have walkthrough. So we leave the facility around. This is a days. jammed schedule. Yeah. So, so Monday that's, that's about a seven to a seven to seven day between class in a, yeah, yeah, between class and football. And then yeah. uh, Tuesday, same yeah. exact schedule. Wednesday, same exact it's schedule. It's grueling. Definitely. Uh, if, if you don't have things, uh, you know, after 7 p.m. to come home and, and have something to take your mind off of it all. You I go a little bonkers. Think, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's healthy to to find things that help you step away from, even if it's just for five Because minutes. if you do that much concentrated activity on any one thing, no matter how much right. you go in loving it, it can be taxing. Right, definitely. And then uh, Thursday, okay. that's our off day. But I mean, define off. That's our off day for quote football. Unquote. Uh, so we have sort of a a player led walkthrough yeah. in the morning, uh, and then we have meal check ins throughout the day, and then we have class. So a lot of players put a lot of right. classes overload on the Thursdays. classes on Thursdays and Tuesdays. Okay, yeah. Right. So so you might have you know three or four hours of class that day. Uh, for me. Uh, because of the schedule that I'm on with with the law program, I have night class on Tuesday and Thursday. So I have I have class from six thirty. Have you perfected learning how to sleep standing up? <laughs> well, the, the good the good thing is I always get good sleep. That's yeah, true. That tired. you are not just so, sitting around. You know. You know. You know. I, I never I never lay down and feel unproductive. <laughs> right. uh, so so on on Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, from 6 30 and then 30 I have my night class uh, and so Fridays uh, that's our fast Friday day and we get to the facility around 7 30 uh, we have team meetings and then uh, position meetings and then practice from around 10 to 11 uh, and then we have night meetings from around you know 5 45 to to 7. The time management piece of this alone is its own job. Well, I, I think I think every single athlete, I'm sure some athletes know this, but I think a lot of athletes downplay or don't understand that it is a unique ability to be able to continuously do weeks like this and continue performing, not only under emotional and mental stress and fatigue, but also physical pain. That's right, because you are time. playing a full contact sport that does have some lingering stuff. Absolutely. Even practice, you get dinged up. Stuff like that. Right. Absolutely. And so I think being able to get through that schedule and, and honestly do it in a way where you become a better player over the season is extremely rewarding and skill set building. And I think that's why you see a lot of the time athletes who recognize this and apply it in their professional lives become extremely successful and, you know, have a necessary nature of teamwork and being able to lock into the mission. But to take that individual responsibility for your own time and then apply that to your responsibility to all the other people you're playing the sport with is something that I've heard time and time and time again is what employers like love about working with athletes because they have a fundamental understanding of how those kinds of things work. It's kind of baked in. Right. You take that schedule that you just described, which is by any measure – pretty loony. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a busy schedule by any, by any measure compared to that against anything. Definitely. And then in 2021, 
right? So your junior year, the Supreme Court releases what's called the Alston decision, right? And that's the ruling that the NCAA can't prevent student athletes from profiting off of their educa education related payments. And it's basically the last barrier to fall to allow the modern name image likeness period to come into sports. And what I'm wondering is how, how aware of this were you while this was going on and the impact that it could have on you and other athletes? I think I was more privy to it than other athletes uh, mm. in my position, just because I was UCLA's male rep to the student athletic leadership team, which sat on the Pac-12 council. And I was also our football rep to our Bruin Athletic Council, which is our UCLA general student athlete uh, body representation. And so we had, we had heard rumblings about the bills, especially in the state of California. And then once Austin looked like it was going to pass, there were a lot of companies, there were a lot of athletes who I think were excited about NIL, but didn't really know what it was going to look like. I think there's still folks on either side of the aisle who are still trying to figure it out. But I do um, think I was in a good position to market my name, image, and likeness because I was already brand building beforehand. Like you had mentioned, I had, I had experience yep. with the media early on yep. since middle school. And my senior year in Texas, I was the Gatorade Player of the Year, the Ford Player of the Year, and was on the Whataburger and in and out you know, team of the year awards for the state of Texas. And so I had experience doing press releases, doing interviews, you know, related to brands, doing brand events. And so even though I wasn't paid for those, I had an experience with brands. And I also knew that who I was and what I was doing added value to the community around me and that the media, uh, you know, covered that. So well. you had a, fun, so that combination through high school, <laughs> ironically high school started listening to the awards whataburger in and out burger gatorade i could fill a person up those kinds of awards just on the trade <laughs> trade value alone <laughs> but so right. you take that experience sort of seeing how that machine works a little bit and you combine that with your awareness for you're sitting on the councils related to athletics and sort of saw that coming so you kind of got to build up some momentum as the gates were thrown open to like, to your point, like people still trying to figure out it. I've, you know, people refer to NIL all the time as the wild west, right? Companies and people and brands trying to figure out what's going on, but you kind of saw it coming. You build so momentum and by any measure, you've been incredibly successful with it. The last guy, we have 20 plus partnerships with different brands and charitable groups right now. It's probably around 30 now. During some summer probably coming during this podcast. You were named male NIL athlete of the year twice. I think we know we've sort of touched on the parts of it, like how you attribute that success to like where you, how you got going. But I guess wonder what the big question is for other athletes who are looking at you and saying, how does he do it? Right. What, what advice do you give them? Do you talk to your teammates about it? Do you give them advice on how to do this effectively? What does that advice sound like? I get approached by teammates all the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think I have a reputation, not just on the team, but in general, of doing well in the space. And I think because my teammates see how I am every single day, just even in the football setting, uh, mm -hmm. giving my all to the team that they respect it. Uh, and they feel like if they come to me for advice on anything, uh, that I'm going to shoot it straight to them. Uh, and so whenever somebody asks me, you know, how do I get some deals? How do I build out followers? That type of thing. I always talk about authenticity on their social and being willing to create content. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it comes from just having a grateful heart and realizing, man, it, you know, the schedule sounds grueling. You know, sometimes you're going to go at it with your coaches. Sometimes you're not going to like how much playing time you're getting. But if you were to tell yourself at five years old that this was the position you're going to be in, you'd be thrilled. You'd be overjoyed. Yeah. And sort of realizing, man, I'm really living the dream. There's people on this campus that, you know, look at the life that I have and, and look at the blessing and opportunity I have and, you know, are almost envious of it. All I have to do is pull out my camera. All I have to do is talk about it. And all I have to do is show what I do on a daily basis. 
And I can utilize that as a platform to affect change, to you know earn money, to add value to brands. And so I think it comes down to the authenticity and realizing that the life that we have now that we've earned and worked for is something that can already pay dividends for us. You don't have to be someone else. You don't have to be like someone else. The beauty of name, image, and likeness, it is literally about you and the value that you already carry. I love the expression, approaching it with a grateful heart, because that feeds directly into the idea of authenticity too. Brands and people pick up on that. Every brand I talk to today, the, you know, everything, when they talk about how to get involved in sports, authenticity is what they start with. It's the beginning and the end of the conversation because consumers have gotten so sophisticated. They know when somebody's faking it. And your idea about, first of all, be in love with what you're doing and the moment you find yourself in. And then express that with your day-to-day to showcase that. That's that's gold right there. And brands pick up on that. Yeah. All right, so what I want to do right now, we're going to take a quick break, and I want to dive more into um, your NIL experience and recommendations and things like that, but we're just going to take a quick break for our, uh, for our favorite sponsor, Reflex Gourmet. We'll be right back. If you work in sports business, then you know that we sometimes eat really badly. Stadium food, after all, isn't exactly known for its healthy properties. Yeah, it's gotten better, and there are more options available, but generally speaking, I'm not seeking out the vegetable plate on the concourse. It's kind of ironic, right? You're watching these world-class athletes push themselves to the very limits of human potential, all the while scarfing down a plate of nachos loaded with shaved meat and a hot liquefied cheese that is a color that doesn't appear in nature. And while that food can taste so good going down... I almost always pay for it later on with heartburn and acid reflux. That's when I turn to Reflux Gourmet, the great tasting, all natural answer for acid reflux. You can't even believe how good this stuff tastes. Uh, A chef in Napa Valley curated flavors like vanilla caramel and mint chocolate. And it's all natural. I actually recognize all the ingredients on the label. But most importantly though, it just works. Only one teaspoon of Reflux Gourmet, and I'm good to go. Reflux Gourmet is available on Amazon, and if you use the promo code 10SportsBiz, you'll get 10% off on your first order. All right, so we're back here with Chase Griffin, uh, quarterback for the UCLA Bruins and two-time NIL uh, Male Athlete of the Year. With so many partnerships that you have, You've now had a ton of experience going back to high school, like you just talked about, you know, seeing Gatorades and the Fords and how they do all this stuff. You've interacted with a ton of them. You know, what do you believe brands can learn about working with college athletes? Do you, can you counsel them? Do they seek your suggestions, your input on how they go about it? Absolutely. I think uh, both as far as the brands that I've worked with on the consulting side, but mm-hmm. also for the talent and production side that have done a good job of reaching out and asking how my experience was and through doing sort of re-up campaigns, uh, figuring out how we can better work together. Uh, brands are are finding that it comes down to how engaged can the athlete keep their followership base mm-hmm. and what is the quality of the content that they can create? For me, I take pride in having better content than anybody that works with that brand, whether it be mm-hmm. other athletes, other influencers, whether it be if they hire a, you know, a, a third party to come produce television and linear commercials for them. I want my stuff to look better than everyone else. A little competitive, Mr. Griffin. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think <laughs> it's important to 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 me and and getting to where I'm at now. And I also have fallen in love with the process. One of my favorite things to do is produce music. And when I'm able to take something from scratch, take an idea in my head and have it come out and be productive and be something that other people can enjoy and that can inspire them, that's my favorite aspect of music. That's my favorite aspect of creation. And I think I take that same mindset into content creation. I find it fascinating that you played violin as a kid 
right? So the the idea of creation has sort of been with you from get go, and you also brought up Real Dino as your favorite soccer player, one yeah, of the more yeah. creative athletes yeah. that you'll ever lay eyes on. So this idea of being creative kind of is a thread that runs through your experience from a very very early age, and it seems like it's paying dividends now as brands realize what that kind of creativity and that kind of thoughtfulness can bring to bear for you. It's a fair assumption? Absolutely. Uh, and I also think it's a good mental health output as well to, to be able to have that creative outlet, whether it be with NI or through music. So I'm interested in some thoughts on how you think the administration of NIL is going, right? Because more and more, I think schools are getting pressure to provide resources and guidance and other support for athletes who are interested in in participating in NIL. Um, do you think that's a role that universities should be playing or should they just butt out and this is for the athletes? It's, we just, you just really retained the rights to do this for yourself. How does that balance fit for you? Well, I think from the athlete perspective, all the resources that can be spared to us uh, that help on sourcing deals, uh, when we receive deals, being able to read through them and understand them. And once we agree to them, being able to produce them at a high level and deliver all of those resources uh, would be extremely beneficial to us. And I think that's also beneficial to the school side, yeah. because if you're able to tell athletes on their recruiting trip, if you're able to tell an athlete who might be thinking about uh, opportunity at another university that look, we can maximize you both on and off the field and help you build the skill set that lasts a lifetime. That's a really appealing argument. And I also think that that same mindset should transition to revenue share. The schools and conferences that do the best job of getting media revenue from these extremely large TV deals in the athletes' pockets will be able to recruit better. And those that espouse values of wanting to support their athletes for a lifetime and create better lifestyle and generational wealth for their athletes can literally do it. You know, the services that all these, you know, schools provide are good. I think they are helpful, but not as helpful as a cut check. They're not as helpful as really seeing the athlete can solve a lot of their issues that they have, can solve issues at home if we cut this check that they're rightfully due. And that's part of what was said in the Austin case and is definitely what's said in the House case. What you're saying right now feeds to lovely segue into this next question because you did an interview with Bloomberg about your NIL success. And one of the things that you said during that was that NIL has produced an empowerment and equity opportunity unmatched in the sports world at any time since Title IX. Now, that's a powerful statement right there. So I'm hoping you can take you know, what you just said and combine it with what your point you just made there. And can you expand on that a little bit and why you think that's the case? Well, first, I'll just give a shout out to UCLA. <laughs> Jackie Robinson, integration. Ann Myers Drysdale, Title IX. Ed O'Bannon, NIL. And through the Austin case, not only did it give us back our NIL rights, but it also said that the business model that we live in right now is unjust and in violation of the law of the land. Um, and I think furthermore, with this House case, House versus NCAA, it'll be ruled that athletes are designated a larger portion of the media revenue and media right deals of these extremely large broadcast deals, especially in revenue generating sports. What that means is a large piece of the money that has historically been generated and kept away from college athletes will directly be paid to athletes. And I think schools have a large part in facilitating that in the conferences that lock their schools into doing it the right way. We'll see better performances. We'll see more inspired athletes. 
And in the same way that NIL has brought more viewership, will bring more viewership in this age where on linear TV sports are drawing the most eyeballs of anything. It is the last great meeting place when you think about traditional media and is the reason why so much money is being poured into sports rights professionally, but certainly collegiately as well, as we've seen with the shakeups of the conferences and the way that's all coming out and you know the, the, the dissolution of the Pac-12 and so forth. So I'm interested, do you think that there's then the necessary pathway for athletes, collegiate athletes to be employees of schools or should they still just maintain the status that they have now, but with a bigger share of the pie that's going to, into colleges right now? I think there's a lot of ways to, to go about it. And I know that employee status often is attached to firing on spot at will. And what I will say, even if employee status is the way that athletes and administrations decide to move forward on, they would be contracts. So the same way there are certain coaches who are getting fired and being paid $77 million. <clears throat> Jimbo if Fisher. Athlete, if, if an athlete signs a four or five year contract, you better be ready to pay that payout if you're thinking about cutting them. Not only that, athletes are already forced out of programs for free and they're forced into the transfer portal. On the other side, I'm not sure that employee status is even necessary to pay out. Uh, athletes are already paid in a plethora of ways. I'm currently on scholarship at UCLA. I received a stipend and I received an Austin grant. And for, for athletes and students who are eligible, they can receive Pell Grant, all types of ways that are paid directly through the school. Who's to say that the media revenue can't just be paid out through higher stipends? So I think there's multiple ways of doing it. And I don't think that employee status is out of the question. And I definitely think that it shouldn't be getting scapegoated as a way to say, well, paying the athletes puts them at risk. The only thing that puts athletes at risk is what's already happening. And that's not providing them any type of power or equity. Lost economic and, opportunity. And, and it's frankly putting the whole industry at risk because now you got the Supreme Court saying that it's unjust. It's going to get changed for them. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's take the next step, right? Because we're talking about you know the economic empowerment for college athletes. But what's the next step? And I'm going to... I'm sorry, I'm going to bring up something about USC. So try no. not trying to get too mad at me. All right. So, but uh, USC quarterback Caleb Williams, right? He won the Heisman Trophy last year and uh, is, you know, having another very, very good year for USC. Um, he was going to be among the probably the top draft picks for the upcoming season. And he's indicated or said that he's potentially seeking part ownership of the NFL team that drafts him. So yeah. I'm going to, I want your reaction to the following quote that I heard uh, as a reaction to that. There's this odd sense of entitlement when you haven't done anything yet. You could be the greatest quarterback in USC history. Maybe you can be that. And that's to be acknowledged and applauded. And go to the NFL and be one of the worst ever. Why are you taking, why would you look at this from the perspective that I'm so damn good, I'm so good, you're going to pay me now up front. That's basically what you're going to do. No one is going to give you ownership of the team. As an athlete who thinks a lot about wealth creation and, and providing value and more, I'm interested in your reaction to that statement. Does, does Caleb Williams have a solid fundamental understanding of the value he brings to whatever team that drafts him? Or is he too far out ahead? I think he does. And I, I think athletes nowadays, because of the opportunities we're able to afford and be able to practice while we're still in college, uh, are being able to understand their their marketing value and the ability of using that to create generational wealth. If I'm an owner, uh, do I give Caleb Williams his request? That's up to that team. And that's up to, you know, whatever modules and models they have. Uh, that say drafting Caleb Williams will bring this many more people to the games will make X amount of money. But at the end of the day, there's already professional athletes doing it in, especially in other sports. You have Lionel Messi who just came over and he got 
you know, ownership in a team and made extreme strides. And delivered. Absolutely. And so it is a model that has already worked. Now in the football world, I think there are definitely, there's still a wave and a tide that has to happen in order for that. But I hope Caleb Williams gets his request granted and delivers on it because that means the rest of athletes coming after him will be able to make similar requests. I think it's like, it's apparent, right? That there's something, I think there's something to what he's requesting, right? Because if I'm like, like in the NHL, Connor Bedard was the number one draft pick. He was like one of the quote unquote generational talents, right? How many season tickets did that team sell in the 24 hour period following that announcement? I don't have the exact number in front of you, but it's clear that he and he alone generated a substantial amount of revenue for the team. So I think there's value because that takes the appreciation, the value of the franchise up. It creates the amount of money that's going into the you know season tickets and sponsorships and everything like that. So I, I'm with you. I think that Caleb Williams has made a valid point. And if I was his agent, I would love to sit down and have that argument with whatever team ends up drafting him. In, in every single industry, every single other industry that involves some type of talent, and some type of entertainment and some type of audience. If talent gets to a certain point where they clearly are valuable, then they can request points on a TV show. They can request points on a movie. Artists and producers get a large share of the points on masters and mixes. Uh, I think sports are in a position where we can catch up. And by doing that, it'll make the industry better for, for everyone because finally the talent will have a stake in marketing. It'll have a stake in getting people in the stands. It'll have a stake in getting more people as true fans in in the team. Versus just showing up nine to five, give somebody some equity in something. You'll be amazed at what they end up doing in order to help actualize and realize the value associated with that. Exactly. All right. So Chase, one more question. Um, You know, by all likelihood, your football playing career is, is, is coming to a close uh, after UCLA. Um, what does the future hold for you? I mean, as you see and you start to plot out a post football career with everything that you're doing right now and what is clearly a variety of interests for yourself, what, what do you see happening as coming up in the next few years? Definitely. So I have one more year of eligibility. Okay. Uh, I never count anything out of the question just because I've been in a similar position where it's looking not good for me after sophomore year and then junior mm-hmm. and senior year, I balled out. Yep. Uh, in high school. So I never count anything out of the question just because I know I'll continue preparing. But off the field, uh, I'm a fellow at the UC Investment Office. Uh, the CIO there has become a really good friend and a great mentor of mine. His goal for me is to be a CIO. Um, so being able to see the world from that, you know, macro scale and being able to take sort of, you know, local politics strategies and take them worldwide. Uh, I think it it shrinks the world and and helps my perspective grow. And then in addition to that, I love production. I love being on camera. So hosting and producing uh, long form scripted and unscripted, whether it be TV shows or movies and then music production. Uh, Like it's a hobby of mine that I got really good at. Uh, I've been fortunate to work with really good people, uh, especially at, at Range Music and Internet Money. Uh, and I think that there's a lot more uh, growth to happen in that industry for me. I, I honestly, I can't wait to see how your future unfolds. You've got so many things going on. You like we talked about, you've got this awesome foundation on which to build from Chase Griffin, UCLA quarterback. Uh, two-time NIL Male Athlete of the Year. Thanks very much for joining me today. But before I let you go, uh, I am going to put you uh, in the uh, now infamous lightning round, which is now presented by Reflex Gourmet. These these are a series of questions. You do not know what's coming at you. So uh, I think all your your athletic training will come into play here right now. Quick decision. Okay, ready? All right, one more year of eligibility. Uh, After football, what sport will you pick up to replace it? golf okay get ready for years of frustration with that one <laughs> what song that's played in the locker room right now will you miss the least 
You know, I work with artists a lot, so I got to refrain from saying anything. On that <laughs> You're going to plead the fifth on that one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. All right. What's one brand you'd really like to work with? Chipotle. I eat there a lot. <laughs> Chipotle just in the trade alone. Yeah, even if it's just for the free card. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Pick one. Get drafted by the NFL or write a top 10 song. Say NFL. They'll probably fund the album. <laughs> okay. All right. You've got a BA in public affairs, yeah. an MA in transformative coaching and leadership, uh, and you're currently enrolled in the master's in legal studies program. Yeah. Um, when are you going to medical school? I don't know. There's there's a bunch of med school students in my building. I'm in grad housing, so it might rub off on me. <laughs> you just got to absorb your medical skills. Uh, yeah. All right. Last one. Uh, Chip Kelly said that you know they, he wouldn't be surprised if you became president of the United States someday. Who would you pick to be your running mate? I don't know. I don't know too much about the Northwest, so whoever helps out there. Yeah, David Allman. There you go. There. <laughs> really, I just was my, – my puppy dog eyes were getting big on that one. Appreciate that, Chase Griffin. Chase Griffin, <laughs> thanks so much for joining me today, man, and good luck the rest of the season. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of the One-on-One -on -one Sports Business Conversations podcast. If you enjoyed it, we always appreciate a subscribe, share, comment, or like – and don't forget, you can always find past episodes at abcpartners.com slash podcast. This podcast is written, produced, edited, and hosted by Dave Almey. And theme music was composed by Scott Holmes. <laughs>